Hello, friends, and a warm welcome. 3 ABN Worship Hour, so glad that you've joined us. I'm Pastor James Rafferty, and we are continuing our study in the Bible. Daniel chapter 11 has been our focus for the last three segments. We're going to be doing at least one or two more, maybe even three more, to finish this up. The last moments of Earth's history, or the final moments of Earth's history is what we're talking about. Daniel chapter 11, we've been looking at these verses, especially verses 45 to 40 to 45, in conjunction with Revelation chapter 13. We've learned a lot so far. We'll summarize a little bit of what we've learned, and then we're gonna move into the final verses that we haven't covered, specifically verses 41 to 45, and then of course, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verses one through three. So again, so glad you've joined us. Wanna encourage you to get a Bible, get a pen, uh, get some paper, take some notes. We're going to be looking at a lot of Bible verses. Uh, we're not going to be throwing a lot of uh, statements up on the video here. We're going to be doing it the old-fashioned way. We're going to be going into the Word of God to try to understand what is being prophesied here in Daniel chapter 11. Of course, before we do that, we want to start with a word of prayer. So join me as we ask for the Holy Spirit to be here with us. Father in heaven, just want to thank you again for this opportunity to study your word. I want to pray that you will guide us, our minds, our hearts, take us to heaven. Help us to understand. Jesus promised us that when we read the book of Daniel, we will understand these prophecies. So, Father, we claim that promise and we claim your promise in John chapters 14, 15, 16, that you would send the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would teach us and instruct us and convict us and comfort us. Do that for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to just summarize a little bit of what we've learned so far. The, the main point that we've been focusing on as we've moved through these verses is the new covenant. Uh, our first meeting on Daniel 11 was entitled Rage Against the Covenant. And it was focusing primarily on several verses in Daniel 11. Let me just point out the verses. Verses 20. 2, and then Daniel 11, verses 28, verses, verse 30, and verse 32. And in each of these verses, we have a description of a power that is working against the Holy Covenant, having indignity, uh, is being indignant against the covenant, having rage against the covenant, destroying the prince of the covenant. We realize then, as we look at Daniel chapter 11, these final verses, at least from uh, verse 22 and onward, there is an assault, an attack made against God's holy covenant. And we identified the holy covenant and the prince of the covenant being Jesus Christ. We identified God's holy covenant when we looked at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 12. The Holy Covenant is God putting His law in our hearts and our minds. It's His power and it is the Holy Spirit and us being instructed by the Holy Spirit to be His people and then finally His cleansing of our sins and iniquities so that they are completely blotted out. So we see the Holy Covenant being undermined in Daniel chapter 11 by a power that is identified as the fourth power of the book of Daniel's four visions, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11. And that power is Rome in two phases, pagan Rome and papal Rome. Now, as we look through Daniel chapter 11, verses 30, all the way down to verse 39, we found that this depicts the Dark Ages, the 1260 days or prophetic days or literal years of Bible prophecy when the church went into the wilderness. And as the church went into the wilderness during this period, we pick up in, Dan in Revelation chapter 12, the woman fleeing into the wilderness and being fed of God for the same period, 1260 prophetic days or literal years. And during that time, the church transitioned from the Jewish church to the Christian church. We see that very clearly in Revelation chapter 12. And again, I'm just reviewing Revelation chapter 12 pictures a woman symbolic of God's people. And this woman brings forth a man child who is caught up to heaven. That is speaking about Messiah, Jesus Christ. In verse five, he's caught up to heaven. And then in verse six, the church, the Jewish church transitions to the Christian church, at least in the prophetic language of Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12 verse six, the woman flees into the wilderness. That's the Christian church fleeing from persecution. And that continues on all the way through until 1798 when the woman comes out of the wilderness 
and the remnant of her seed are identified as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. During that wilderness time, the woman is helped by the earth, the persecution of the dragon, the waters that the dragon throws out of his mouth, the persecution that come ag comes against the woman from the dragon uh, during the dark ages is swallowed up by the earth, which is symbolic or represent representing America, the continent of America, a land where the woman fled with eagle's wings to find economic blessings and, and religious liberty or freedom, freedom to worship God according to dictates of conscience. So we're just kind of catching up here because in Daniel chapter 11 verse 41 it says this power is going to enter into the glorious land and we've identified that already in a previous uh, study. We've identified the glorious land as the land of America, this place where the woman found refuge during the dark ages. So we find the glorious land in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, being entered into by the king of the north. And what we're going to see here in this context is, is that there is going to be an undermining of the principles of religious and civil freedom, the lamb-like principles identified in Revelation 13, 11. There's going to be an undermining of those principles and many will be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And that's basically where we left off. We left off in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 41. We've done a, a comparison with Daniel 11 and Revelation chapter 13, and we've been moving through and seeing the parallels between these two chapters. And we're gonna do a summary of all of that in our last meeting when this whole series is over. So you can look forward to that if you're a little bit lost right now. If you haven't seen meeting number one, meeting number two, meeting number three, you need to go back and watch those. They're all available on 3ABN, Worship Hour, YouTube. You can pick all of those up and then you'll be able to catch up with where we are right now in Revelation, or excuse me, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 41. So let's pick up here, Daniel 11 verse 41. It says here he's going to enter the glorious land identifying, identified in relationship to Revelation 12 and 13 as America, the land flowing with milk and honey, economically blessed, the land with civil and religious liberty for the woman who's fleeing persecution during the dark ages. And then it says he's going to overflow, uh, excuse me, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So who are these tribes identified as escaping out of the hand of this king of the north power as it's seeking to consolidate its strength and control the world? And by the way, control of the world is what we see in these verses following verse 41. Verses 42 to 45, control of the world economic control and spiritual control of the world. That's exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 13. The whole world is going to follow after this earthly power identified symbolically as a beast and everyone's going to have to receive a mark in their forehead or in their hand if they want to be able to buy or sell. And those that don't comply are going to lose their lives. Their lives are going to be threatened. There's going to be a death decree against them. We'll see the same thing here in these verses. So who are these tribes representing? And what does it mean that they escape? Well, let's just look at that word escape real quickly because that word is the same word that is used in Daniel chapter 12 and verse one, when Michael, that prince that stands for the children of thy people, stands up and delivers his people during the time of trouble such as never was. That word delivered, everyone's gonna be delivered that is found written in the book. That word delivered is the same root word for the Hebrew word for the word escape in Daniel 11 and verse 41. In other words, whatever happens with Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon also happens with God's people in Daniel 12, 1, who are written in the book. So you've got this group of people in Daniel 11, 41, and this group of people in Daniel 12, 1 that are coming together. They're, both of them are escaping or being delivered out of the hand of this king of the north power. All right, so that gives us a little bit of a hint. We've got the people that are delivered in Daniel 12, 1 are the ones written in the book. They're the same or they're having the same experience of deliverance and rescue as the people in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 41. But who are they? Are these literal tribes? Are these the literal tribes of, uh, of, of Moab and Edom and Ammon? We know that these uh, tribes originally represented the, the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Lot. 
and the um, children that he had with, with his incestuous uh, daughters. So the Moabites, the Ammonites were the children of Lot, Edomites were the children of Esau. Now the thing that we understand about these tribes, because they're not around anymore, we can't take this literally, is that they are connected or were connected with God's covenant people. Now what do I mean by God's covenant people? Well, Abraham, was and Jacob were, were and Isaac are the is the is the line of God's covenant people taking us all the way down to Jesus Christ, and so you have Abraham, you have Jacob or Isaac and Jacob. Well, Abraham was connected with Lot. That was his cousin. Uh, Lot was well, Abraham was Lot's uncle, so they were connected. And then you have uh, Lot's children being connected, of course, again um, with Abraham. Lot's children from his daughters. And then you have Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. So you have this uh, familial connection between Edom and Ammon and Moab and the covenant people, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what does that mean? Well, we know that these tribes became enemies of God's people. They separated from God's people. And when God's people were brought out of Egypt, out of bondage, these tribes were there to, uh, to hassle them and fight against them. So there was, there was a, a, a friction that took place. There was a separation that took place between these people and God's covenant people. And so God is identifying here a people that are going to have the same experience as God's people in Daniel 12.1, which means that these people in Daniel 11.41 are going to come back together with God's covenant people in Daniel 12, verse 1, that are written in the book and are going to be delivered out of the hand of this king of the north power. Now, you want to follow this carefully because we're going to go to a Bible prophecy right now that is profound in its implications concerning Daniel chapter 11. It's probably the only place where we're going to see Edom and, and Moab and Ammon identified in the context of what we've just talked about, and that is coming together with God's people, being reunited with God's people. Basically, those who were once connected with God's people then became the enemies of God's people are now going to reconnect with God's people. And what I want to say, what we want to understand in in simple language is there are many people who were once connected with God's church, many people who are part of God's church, who have left God's church, even become enemies to God's church, who in the last days are going to rejoin God's church. Now we're going to see this confirmed in a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. This is our key prophecy, Isaiah chapter 11. This is an amazing prophecy. I love Isaiah chapter 11 for two reasons. One, the first half of this chapter talks about Jesus. The first half of this chapter talks about Jesus. And any prophecy of the Bible that talks about Jesus, that's a prophecy of the Bible that I just love. Let's just look at that part of it for a second. Isaiah chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. So Jesse was the father of David. And the branch, capital B, is talking about Christ, who became the son of David. So you have Jesse birthing David, and David's heritage going down, his lineage leads to Jesus Christ, who was called the son of David. And then it says in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's seven spirit. That's a sevenfold spirit of God resting upon Jesus Christ. So this is a fulfillment of what we see in the book of Revelation where it says the seven spirits of God rested upon him. And of course, we want to understand this in a symbolic way. It's not talking about a literal number necessarily, but the completeness the, the number seven means complete or perfect. The completeness of the Spirit of God rested upon Jesus Christ. Then it says in verse three, and it shall make him, that is the Spirit of God in its completeness shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor 
and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now, this is talking about Christ when he first came and how he didn't judge people after the sight of his eyes. He didn't make uh, judgments after the hearing of his ears. A perfect illustration of this would be when this woman in John chapter 8 was, was brought before Christ and thrown before him by the Pharisees because she was caught in adultery in the very act. And they told him this woman was caught in adultery in the very act and Moses said she should be stoned. And of course he could see with his eyes and he could hear with his ears that she was guilty, but he didn't judge according to the sight of his eyes or according to the hearing of his ears. He judged with righteous judgment. And so he started writing in the sand and as he started writing in the sand, all these accusers began to walk away and he said, he that is without sin among you, let him fast cast the first stone and there was none that accused her. And then he said to the woman, neither do I accuse you, go and sin no more. That is a fulfillment of this very prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11. So the first half of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11 applies to Jesus. And as you continue to read it, it moves right into the new heavens and the new earth. It talks about the lion and the wolf and the lamb and the fatling all sitting down together and a little child leading them. And then it talks about the suckling child playing in the hole of a poisonous uh, snake of an asp and a cockatrice den, cockatrice den. And then it says in verse nine, they shall not hurt nor destroy and all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So verses one through nine, they take in the ministry of Christ. And then of course, all the way through to the new heavens and the new earth. And then we go back in verse 11. Uh, verse 10 says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. This ensign is talking about Christ. We are to lift up Jesus Christ. He says, I, if I be lifted up, John 12, 32, will draw all unto me. So as we see Christ lifted up, uh, he becomes an ensign of the people, and the Gentiles seek him, and his rest is glorious. Now, verse 11 and it, comes to, it shall come to pass in that day. This is post Christ, but before the thousand years, before the new heavens and the new earth, it'll come to pass in that day when Jesus is lifted up, when the gospel is taken to all the world, as we've been commissioned to do in uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19 or 19 and 20. When this happens, when Jesus is lifted up, notice verse 11, the Lord shall set his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. This is a worldwide work. Jesus told us in Matthew 28, go to all the world and preach the gospel. Lift up Jesus Christ, lift up the gospel, let all be drawn unto him. This verse is actually placing us in our present day situation. The ministry, for example, of three angels broadcasting, taking the gospel to all the world through these satellites and through these messages, reaching every corner of the globe. This is a fulfillment of, of uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. And God is going to draw back the outcasts of Israel. Let's continue to read here and see what we're told is going to happen as the gospel's taken to all the world. Verse 12, he shall set up an ensign for the nations. And that ensign is Jesus Christ. And he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, those who have gone away from the fold, be they, um, you know, Presbyterians or Baptists or Catholics or, or Adventists or, or Jews, whoever they are, whoever has, has left God, left the fold. Remember Jesus says in John chapter 10, other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also will I call and there'll be one shepherd and one fold, right? So he's going to gather the outcasts of Israel. He's going to um, gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, right? So this is a worldwide message. When Jesus comes the second time in Matthew 24, his angels gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. That means in every direction, north, south, east, and west, God's people are going to be gathered. Before they're gathered literally by the angels to go to heaven, they're going to be gathered spiritually back into the fold, the truth of God by the lifting up of Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 13, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. 
Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Okay, all of this vexing, all of this jealousy, all of this envy that takes place within God's church, among God's people, all that's going out the window. When this prophecy is fulfilled, all of that goes out the window. And we're going to see God's people present a united front. They're going to come together in Jesus Christ. No one's going to say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Apollos. They're all going to say, I am of Christ and I cleave unto him. But in that day, uh, verse 14, they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west, which means they're coming from the east. And that's an important point to notice as we get back to Daniel chapter 11. They're going to they're going to fly, up, uh, um, fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west and they shall spoil them of the east together. Now I'm going to stop right there. We'll, we'll get to our point here in just a second. But just let's understand these, this part of the verse. They'll fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Now the Philistines are not notably God's, uh, the enemy of God's people. And so this verse today would mean that it's the enemies of God's people that are going to support the message, the proclamation of this message. That's because in the very end of time, when no one can buy or sell, no one of God's people can buy or sell, we're going to be totally dependent on the secular press on the Philistines, if you will, who are really out to persecute us, but in persecuting us and, in, and targeting us and making mention of God's people, they're actually going to be helping to proclaim the message that we share because in persecution, we're going to be brought before kings and rulers to give a reason of the faith that is in us. And, and many people listening to that are going to be convinced of the truth of the gospel that God's people are sharing and they're going to become believers. That's what's taking place here in this verse. So Continuing on, and it says here, they're going to spoil them of the East together. That means they're coming um, to, uh, against these Eastern religions. And I just want to say that one of the marks today of Eastern religion is this idea of the immortal soul. I mean, the idea that the, that the, that the soul somehow... Um, escapes from the body at death and continues on in some type of form, whether that's reincarnation or whether that's, you know, living in the, in the spirit in some ethereal uh, way outside of your body. That's Eastern religion. That's the essence of Eastern religion, that we will not surely die. The first lie that was ever told uh, by Satan in the Garden of Eden. And that is going to be completely dismantled when this message is proclaimed, because this message is focusing on the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ brings with it the resurrection of the dead. And there's no need for a resurrection of the dead if, if we're already alive somewhere outside of our bodies. There's no need for a resurrection of the dead because we're not dead. But if what the Bible teaches is true, if we are actually dead, then this message is going to have a powerful impact upon people because they're going to realize that yes, when you die, you die completely, not 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 surely, but com I mean, not not surely, but completely surely you die and the resurrection is our only hope. And of course, that resurrection we hope for all who believe is the resurrection, uh, first resurrection of the righteous or the just. But notice what it says here. They're going to fly up. I'm going to read the whole verse again. They're going to fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They're going to spoil them of the east together. All of that eastern mysticism is going out the window. And they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. And that's where we get our connection with Daniel chapter 11. So Daniel chapter 11 is connecting these three tribes together as escaping out of the hand of the king of the north. And we've identified the king of the north as the papal Roman power. And that papal Roman power is immersed in spiritualism. They're immersed in the idea that the soul escapes from the body at death and goes on to live in a place called purgatory or in heaven or in hell, which is not what the Bible teaches. And so when this message goes forth in the end of time, there are going to be a lot of people who have left the church, who've left the truth, who've left the word of God. Maybe they're in other churches. Maybe they're in Babylon in confusion about this, but they are going to realize the truths of God's word and they're going to lay their hand on them. God's people are going to lay their hand on them and they're going to obey them. They're going to come out of Babylon, Revelation chapter 18. They're going to come out of Babylon and they're going to stand with God's people. They're going to escape out of the hand of the king of the north. So these verses, Daniel excuse me, Isaiah chapter 11, verses uh, 11, all the way through the rest of, of the chapter, verse 16, help us to understand what's going on in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. Let's read the rest of the verses. 
and the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea and his mighty wind shall make it shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. Now that's very symbolic language. It's very difficult to understand this, but let's just take, uh, let's just put some effort in here. God is talking about what happened with Egypt. God is talking about this tongue of the Egyptians. God is talking about the river that's going to be smitten so that God's people go over dry shod. That's all uh, taking us back to the deliverance of God's people from Egypt, right? They went through the Red Sea. Uh, the, the Red Sea was parted so they could go through on dry uh, land. They, they, they destroyed the tongue of the Egyptians. In other words, they destroyed the culture of the Egyptians. They, God took that out of his people as he delivered them from Egypt and brought them into the promised land. We have a heavenly Canaan and God is going to destroy this Egyptian, this, this uh, worldliness, the secularism that we have uh, imbibed uh, on this earth. He's going to take that out of us. He's going to deliver us uh, through the waters, the, the multitudes, uh, nations and peoples and tongues, Revelation 17, 15. We'll look at that in more detail in a minute. And he's going to bring us uh, to the heavenly Canaan um, by his mighty power. And then verse 16, and, they shall, they, and there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people that shall be left from Assyria like it was um, to Israel in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. So there you go. There's the, there's the application to the land of Egypt, and yet it's being applied to God's people in the end of time. So uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 through 16 are going to help us to understand Daniel chapter 11 and verse 41. It's really simple. Let me just summarize it this way. In Daniel 11 verse 41, it is saying that as the king of the north comes against atheism, the king of the south in verse 40, with chariots and horsemen and many ships and overflows and passes over into these, all these countries that are going to be named here as we continue to study, as that happens, a lot of people are going to wake up and they're going to realize, whoa, this is, being, this is prophecy being fulfilled. There's a, there's a group of people that have been talking about this happening for a long time. They're called Seventh-day Adventists and they've been talking about this in relationship to Revelation chapter 13 about how this king of the north power would receive a wound when the wound would be healed and he would come back like a whirlwind and take control of all of the countries and take control of the economy of the world and enforce a worship to the point that no man would be able to buy or sell. As it says in a, in a verse following here. He's going to plant his tabernacles between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, but he's going to come to his end and none shall help him. So we're seeing some amazing insights here as we look at these two prophecies in Revelation 11, or excuse me, in Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 coming together. There's a lot for us to understand here, a lot of study to do. So I'm sure we're going to have to have a couple more sessions on this. Let's continue now into verse 42. And he, now this is talking about this king of the North Power that we've identified as, as Papal Rome with the support of the United States because they're coming together in Daniel 11 and in Revelation 13. They're coming together to make, an, the, the one is making an image to the other. The United States is imaging the papacy and they're coming together to enforce worship in the last days. And he shall have power, oh, excuse me, verse 42. And he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, We've already identified the king of the south in Daniel 11 verse 40 as atheism, right? We used uh, Isaiah chapter 30 verses 1 through 6, south, the, the country that was to the south of Israel was the country of Egypt. And Egypt, according to Exodus 5 verse 2, represented a country who denied God. He denied um, God's voice. He wouldn't listen to God. He wouldn't let his people go. I don't know God. Who's God that I should let his people go? And we saw this, uh, this prophecy being fulfilled in 1790 according to Revelation chapter 11 with this power that was identified as coming out of the bottomless pit that inflicted a deadly wound against the king of the north in 1798 at the time of the end. And of course that power, that atheistic power rose up in France and eventually it spread through all of Europe and we in our day recognized that Eastern Europe became what we call the Soviet bloc or the USSR, right? They were the modern manifestation of this atheistic power, but they weren't the only manifestation of the, this atheistic power. And when he, the King of the North, pa the papacy with the help of the United States as we studied in a previous meeting, the, the Holy Alliance, when the papacy came against this power with chariots and horsemen, that is military might of the United States, building up missiles, etc., in the western 
um, uh, Western European countries, and then again with ships, that is economic uh, pressure, which is exactly what we read about in Reader's Digest happening as the uh, President Reagan and the Pope John Paul II work together, conspire together to bring down the USSR uh, through the Solidarity Movement. We recognize that this was a fulfillment of prophecy in relationship to the fall of the King of the South, right, that took place as the fulfillment of, of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. But now we're in verse 42. And now we have Egypt mentioned again. And what that tells us is that God prophetically is right on target because even though the USSR came down, we still have a second atheistic power that is at large in the world today. And that power is none other than China, right? China is still very much a threat, an atheistic power threat to the Western world. We know that because that's what we're told over and over again. China is a threat to the Western world. And yet, according to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 42, the land of Egypt, that is a second atheistic power, not the one that's already fallen, verse 40, shall not escape. This land of Egypt that I think is identifying China, and let me just say it this way, I believe that Bible prophecy is predicting that the power of China will not escape the twofold combination of the papacy and the United States as they seek to enforce the mark of the beast in these last days. So that's what we see taking place here in verse 42. It's a prediction, if you will. It's a prophetic prediction. You know, we've wondered about this power, what's gonna happen, and sometimes, well, it's not so strong, and then other times it is strong. Depending on what the news says, we can go either way with this country, but we don't wanna depend as Christian believers on what the news says. We wanna depend on what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says that China is gonna follow along with the protocol that everyone else has to follow along with. No one, whether they're great or small, rich or poor, free or bond, no one is gonna get an exemption card. Everyone is going to have to go along with this enforced worship. Everyone's going to have to go along with receiving the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hand. The hand signifying going along with it, not necessarily believing it. Now, you can only receive the seal in your forehead. You have to believe it, but the seal of God, excuse me, but the mark of the beast you can receive in your forehead or in your hand, which would imply secular powers going along with it, but not necessarily believing it. And of course, we could, I could, we could share a lot about that, but right now we don't have time. Let's continue on. So... Notice verse 43, and he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt. Ah, oh, there's Egypt mentioned again, atheistic power. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So now we have this economic control. And I'm just going to say it this way, this worldwide economic control right? Gold, silver, and precious things. That's the economic control. He's going to have power over that. So he's got economic control. This is exactly what we see in Revelation 13, so that no man can buy or sell. That implies economic control. The same thing is being repeated right here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 43. It says that he has power over the treasures of gold and silver and precious things uh, of Egypt. And the Libyans, and Libya would be a Middle Eastern country, and the Ethiopians, and the Ethiopian, Ethiopian is understood to be an African country will follow or be uh, at his step. So you've got the USSR mentioned in verse 40 and other uh, Soviet bloc countries. They came down in 1989, 1990. Then you've got the glorious land, which represents America. They're acquiescing. They're, they're being entered into and making an alliance, uh, a holy alliance, uh, according to Time magazine, an image to the beast, according to Revelation 13. And then you've got the country of Egypt. You've got China here. And of course, that would take in Cuba and, and, and uh, uh, North Korea because they're dependent on uh, each other. And then you've got... Uh, uh, Libya, that's the Middle East, and then you've got the Ethiopians, that's Africa. You see what the Bible is saying here? And you've got other countries that are mentioned here he's going to enter into. Many countries are going to be overthrown. You've got a worldwide movement of control being depicted right here in Daniel chapter 11, and that's exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 13, right? All the world, everyone in the world follows. The whole world wanders after the beast. Revelation 13, verse 3, his deadly wound is healed and the whole world wonders. Well, in Revelation 13, it just says the whole world wonders. In Daniel chapter 11, it identifies these different countries, these different 
uh, uh, nations or localities taking in the whole world. The Libyans, Middle East, the Ethiopians, Africa, uh, Egypt, China, and the King of the South, USSR, and the Glorious Land, America, all of these nations coming together, all of these nations becoming one, becoming one in solidarity. And of course, Revelation 17 summarizes that. You have these seven kings, and then you have the seventh king, and then you have these 10 kings that have received no kingdom as yet, but they give the power unto the beast. All of them consolidate together to form one power to seek to war against the Lamb and those that are with Him who are called, faithful, and chosen. And of course, hopefully that's going to be us. That's going to be these three tribes. That's going to be those who are written in the book, those who delivered uh, when Michael stands up. Now going to verse 44. Verse 44 says, but, and I like this, but that means even though this power is moving right along, just chugging right along and taking in all of these countries and overwhelming them and passing over into them and everyone's following his steps and he's got control over the silver and the gold and the precious things of Egypt, but, right? But that means there's, there's something that, that puts a pause, that puts a check in his momentum. And what is it that puts a check in his momentum? Is it, is it, uh, is it some kind of uh, communicate from, from people? Is it, is it some kind of uh, patriarch movement or some kind of, uh, you know, groups of people in different places that have stored up enough ammo and enough supplies to fight against this system and somehow overcome it? No, indeed it is not. It is not going to be anything that humans can do. It's not going to be any message or communication that, that humans fabricate that puts a check on this worldwide power. What we see here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, is tidings, that is the good news of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, out of the east and out of the north. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. If you are storing up ammo and guns and food and supplies for your little time of trouble, where you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere, and you think that being out in the middle of nowhere is going to save you from, um, you know, the tentacles of this power as it reaches out and swallows up the world, you're mistaken. It is not being out in the middle of nowhere with our little supplies of food and our supplies of ammunition that's going to save us. It's going to be the everlasting gospel, the good news, the tidings out of the east and out of the west, excuse me, out of the east and out of the north. That's what's going to trouble this power. Now, this power, when it hears those tidings, is going to go forth to destroy and utterly make away many. There's a death decree here that's implied. We see the same thing again in Revelation chapter 13, right? No man can buy or sell. And uh, if you don't receive the mark, you're going to be... Uh, uh, marked for death, right? Same thing in Revelation chapter 13, verses 15, 16, and 17. So what we see here is that the only hope for planet Earth during this time is tidings out of the east and out of the north. That's what troubles him, and that's the only hope that we have. And those tidings are, in Revelation 14, 6, the everlasting gospel, what we call the three angels' messages. We're here, at, we're at, here at Three Angels Broadcasting Network, and we have a three angels' message, and that's what's being proclaimed here. In fact, let's just take a closer look at this. Let's look at a few Bible verses here in, in the Bible. Revelation uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3 are the first verses we want to look at. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, because you'll notice here that there's an angel that is ascending from the east. Revelation uh, 7, verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor in any tree. That's what's happening right now. Right now, we see the four winds of strife being held back. Now, when it says four, it's not talking in literal sense. Four means north, south, east, and west. We're talking about a worldwide withholding of strife and war and bloodshed and famine. Now, you might think, well, it seems like the, the, that's happening in our world today. Yes, it is. So these winds are kind of being let loose a little bit, but they're not completely let loose until God's servants are sealed with the seal of God in contrast to the mark of the beast. And the seal of God, it says in verse 2, it comes to us from an angel that sends from the, guess what? The east. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of God, the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I wish we could do a whole study here on the 144,000, but I want to give a little 
uh, shout out for Salvation in Symbols and Signs. Uh, it's a program that you can find on Dare to Dream. Uh, you can find it on 3ABN Plus app. You can find it on the YouTube app and that, or on YouTube, 3ABN YouTube. And that program, 112 presentations on Daniel and Revelation has a whole uh, presentation or two or three on the 144,000 because we don't have time to cover that right now. But let's just think about this. What we see here is the seal of God. The angel with the seal of God symbolizes coming from the east. That troubles him. The, the tidings, the message of the sealing of God's people troubles him. Why? Because the seal of God stands counter to the mark of the beast. The seal of God involves being sealed into the truth so we can't be moved, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Settled into the gospel so we can't be moved. It involves the stamp of God's character on our foreheads. We're going to have our na His name written in our foreheads. And the name of God is synonymous with the law of God. The law of God is a transcript of His character. And in the center of that law, we find the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath. And so we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, uh, if the Sabbath is the seal, how can the Holy Spirit be the seal? Well, because uh, it's very clear that the Sabbath is part of God's law, and God's law is a transcript of His character. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. So God's character is revealed in His law. So when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, which who is God, we're sealed with with His law. And of course, the fourth commandment identifies the seal because it identifies our Creator and His territory, heaven and earth, and the one who has died for us and redeemed us through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth. And that is why the Sabbath is of such vital importance in the last days. That is why this King of the North power is seeking to set up His counterfeit system uh, in, in contrast to God's day of worship. And that word, of course, worship is used all through Revelation chapters 13 and 14 when it describes the conflict between God and these powers in the last days. So you have the sealing angel coming from the east, tidings out of the east and out of the north. What does the north represent? Well, notice this. This will kind of confirm both uh, of, of, of the thoughts we're going to be talking about here in relationship to the east and the north. Isaiah 41 verse 25. Isaiah 41 verse 25 is talking about Jesus Christ returning to this earth. It's a prophetic verse and it says, I've raised up one from the north. That's where Jesus comes from. He comes from the north yeah, because God is the true king of the north. And Jesus comes from God. He comes from his throne. He comes from the north. And he shall come up from the rising of the sun. That's the east. The sun rises in the east. And Jesus told us, like lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the son of man be. So he comes from the north, from God's uh, throne room, and he comes from the east, right? And that's what Revel uh, Isaiah 41 verse 25 says, I raised up one from the north. He shall come from the rising of the sun. He shall call upon my name. He shall come upon the princes as upon mortar and as the potter treads the clay. And what we're seeing here very clearly is the same thing that is revealed to us in Revelation chapter 6 and verses 15 to 17. You know, the Jesus returns and the wicked men and the mighty men and the captains all cry for the rocks and mountains to fall on them. He's going to tread them down like the potter treads clay. So what we see here in Daniel chapter 11 is that these tidings represent the message of the sealing angel and the message of the second coming of Jesus. The sealing angel comes from the east. The seal of God, of course, is the seal of, of the Holy Spirit, the character of God. The essence of that character is the law of God, a transcript of his character. So we're sealed into the law so we can't be moved. The Sabbath is the center of that law and then and the seventh day Sabbath. And then we have the north, which represents the direction from which Christ comes. He comes from the north and from the rising of the sun. So basically what you have, these tidings represent people who are proclaiming the seventh day Sabbath as the seal of God and the second coming of Jesus Christ. In a sense, you could say that verse 44 is talking about Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh day pointing to the seal of God in the Sabbath, the transcript of his law, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Seventh day, the Sabbath, Adventist, the second coming of Jesus. So we could say the tidings of the Seventh-day Adventists shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many 
Seventh-day Adventists. And of course, we know that this is true in connection with Revelation chapter 13, because in Revelation chapter 14, we have the three angels' message, which is calling the whole world to worship God who created heaven, earth, and seas, and fountains of waters. And that message closes with the proclamation of those who keep the commandments of God and keep the faith of Jesus. And these people are identified in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, as the remnant church, the leftovers, the remaining ones, those who remain faithful to the truth of the Bible. And this is going to upset him because this power is talking about a thousand years of peace and prosperity on this planet Earth. And Adventists are saying, no, 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 no. That's not the way it's going to go. It's going to get worse and worse. It's going to get worse and worse until finally Jesus is going to come and he's going to rescue us from this planet Earth. And there's going to be this time of test and then there's going to be this time of loud cry proclamation when everyone's called to give a decision for the truth of God's word as identified here in this message of the three angels and then there's going to be a closer probation and when Jesus returns those who have accepted him and, and been sealed with the seal of God are going to be raised up. Those who are alive are not going to perceive those who are asleep in Christ. They're going to, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and they're going to be raised up. First Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17. They're going to meet the Lord in the air and they're ever going to be with the Lord. The wicked are going to be slain, Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. They're going to be slain and they're going to be strewn across the earth for a thousand years. This earth is going to sit desolate with only the devil and his angels to walk around in this, in, in this prison-like confinement for a thousand years while there's a judgment that takes place in, in, the, in heaven uh, where God God's people sit with him. You can read about this in Revelation chapter 20 where God's people sit on thrones and judge the wicked during that thousand year time. And then of course, Jesus returns according to Jude with his saints with him to convince all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they've committed. And we see the executive judgment take place again, Revelation chapter 20. So this message troubles him because people are starting to believe this message. They're, 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 actually, they're actually being awakened with this convicting power of the Holy Spirit and they're taking their stand. They're coming out of Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. They're coming out of all these dispersed places, all these people that have, that have left and gone to the four corners of the earth are now coming back into the truth of the Bible. God's church is being purified. People are going out by uh, company after company is going out and tribe after tribe is coming in. A great exchange is, being ta is taking place place during this loud cry message when these tidings go forth. And this finally gets to the place where they say enough is enough. We just need to rid the earth of these this little remnant people. They're destroying our plans for the future. Uh, we just need to get rid of them. Their message is not in harmony with our agenda. We're just going to get rid of them and then we can go on uh, with our plan. And of course, this doesn't happen because we have verse 45. Verse 45 tells us, and he, this power, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So we see here that this power thinks it can eliminate the remnant and go on with his plans of planting his tabernacles between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. But he is going to come to his end and none shall help him because at that time Michael's going to stand up. Now one of the things that we misunderstand about verse 45 is the literalness. We think it's a literal prophecy. that This is going to take place between the two seas in the Middle East, literally in the Middle East. Whereas this Bible prophecy that we're reading here, Daniel chapter 11, 40 to 45, is a worldwide prophecy. It's not a, a prophecy that's focused just on the Middle East. It's a worldwide prophecy. We see this in Revelation 13. And the seas and the glorious holy mountain are not the two places between which this power sits, but rather they are two distinct places that this power is trying to to, to get to obscure. In other words, well, let's just look at the verses here. In other words, the, the, um, the seas represent in Revelation 17, 15, peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues, waters. And then the glorious holy mountain, that represents Mount Zion. In Revelation 14, verse 1, God's people are pictured on Mount Zion. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, Mount Zion is pictured as God's church in heaven where the books register God's faithful people. In Psalm 48, 1 and 2, uh, Mount Zion is the place where God dwells. In Isaiah 14, verses um, uh, tw uh, 12 through 14 uh, and 15 through 20, Mount Zion is the place where Satan wants to sit in the sides of the north. He wants to sit in God's place. And that's 
the plan that's being carried out in verse 45. It's the same plan we see in Revelation chapter 13 because we know that the dragon, according to Revelation 12, 7 through 9, is none other than the serpent, the devil, that old serpent that deceives the world. And that dragon is who gives the place and power to the first beast, the uh, sea beast, Revelation 13, that is the papacy, and it's the same power that gives power and strength to the, the, lamb, the beast with lamb-like horns that comes out of the earth, who ends up speaking like a dragon, who has the voice of a dragon. These two earthly powers come together in the dragon, who is Satan. Satan is the one behind setting up this false system of worship. In Revelation 13, it's the mark of the beast. But in Daniel chapter 11, it's identified as him planting a tabernacles of his palace. Now, that word tabernacles is used over a hundred times in the Bible to describe God's place of worship. So you've got his tabernacles, this, that is the tabernacles of the king of the north, his place of worship is being put in the place of God's place of worship. And the seas would simply represent the peoples of this world, same thing we see in Revelation, the whole world is going to follow, the whole world is going to worship, and the glorious holy mountain is Mount Zion. Right? The glorious holy mountain, according to the Bible, is Mount Zion where God's people are registered. Mount Zion where Jesus is. Mount Zion where the Lamb is and where we are to be with Him, according to Ephesians chapter 2, sitting in heavenly places. So what is happening here is the devil, through his earthly powers, is seeking to establish a false system of worship, his tabernacles between the seas, the peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues of this world, and the glorious holy mountain. He's seeking to obscure the worship that belongs to God by planting himself between the peoples of this earth and God. But he will come to his end and none shall help him, because at that time, Michael shall stand up. Now, what is that, that time? That time is the time when the loud cry has gone forth. That time is the time when God has lifted up an ensign for the people according to Isaiah chapter 11 that we just read there, Isaiah 11, 11 through 16, when he has uh, gathered the dispersed of Judah and, and the outcasts of Israel. And we've gathered them all back together and, and Edom and Ammon and Moab uh, uh, are obeying him when people are coming back into the fold. And, and of course, some will be leaving the fold. There'll be a great exchange taking place. That time is the time when the glad tidings out of the east and out of the west, the, the seventh day Sabbath, the seal of God and the second coming of Jesus Christ are proclaimed throughout all the world, those, those tidings that trouble him because it undermines his agenda. That time is the time when God's people are going to be sealed because they resisted the war of the dragon, because they have not loved their lives even unto the death. As the death decree has come against them, they have stood firm for the truth of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting covenant, the holy covenant. That time is a time when God has proclaimed the message to the whole world and given everyone an opportunity to, to respond. According to Revelation chapter 22, that time is a time when God can look out on the whole world and He can say, it wouldn't matter if I kept probation open for another year or another month or another week or another day or another hour. He that is unjust is going to be unjust still and he that is holy is going to be holy still. He that is filthy is going to be filthy still and he that is righteous is going to be righteous still. Let's close this thing up. Everyone's made a, their decision for or against the gospel. That is that time. And at that time, Michael is going to stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. Why? Because there's going to be seven last plagues. And they're called last plagues because there's no mercy in those plagues. And you can read about those in Revelation chapters 15 and 16 and onward. The judgments of God without mercy are going to be poured out. This world is going to be turned upside down, upside down. We have never seen anything like what is going to take place during the seven last plagues. It's going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But notice what it says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. And this is powerful good news. It says, and at that time, Thy people shall be delivered, and then it says, everyone, everyone, not most of them, not almost all of them, not the majority of them, not half of them, but every one of them that shall be found written in the book. All of God's people are going to be delivered. Every single person that resisted the mark of the beast, every single person that said no to enforced worship, that stood for liberty and freedom of conscience, even though they could no longer buy or sell. And of course, we know what that's like. We've already had that little bit of test here in the last three years with the C-19 and the EE jab. We know what it's like to be coerced so that if you don't go along with the majority of people, even though you know they say the science is on their side, 
you will not be able to have access. You will not be able to buy or sell. You, not, you, you will not be able to, be, to, to go to school. You will not be able to finish your job or to go to work or to receive a paycheck. We already have a little bit of taste of what that's like. And God has given that taste to us so that we can understand how absolutely sure God's prophetic word is. God has told us that this is going to happen and we can be assured that it's going to happen. But now we need to prepare. And our preparation is not just knowing that this is going to happen. We all know that this is going to happen if we believe the word of God. Our preparation has to be found in doing something else. What is that something else that prepares us to stand in this time of trouble and be delivered by God? What is that something else? Well, it says right here in Daniel 12 and verse 1, this is a hint that everyone's going to be delivered whose name is found in the book. So that gives us a hint. How do we get our names in the book? Or oh, does that mean we join the Seventh-day Adventist Church or some other denomination that's standing for the truth? Well, no, that's not what it's talking about at all because actually in this time, most of the churches and perhaps even the Seventh-day Adventist Church is going to go through a mighty shaking. I shouldn't even say perhaps because we're definitely going to see a mighty shaking in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as well as all the other churches. And that mighty shaking is going to cause people to recognize that they can't put their trust in an institution as it is, but only in the truth, only in the truth. And so God's people are going to have to have their names written in a Another book, uh, Revelation 13, also again parallels this, and we'll look at all the parallels in our next session. But Revelation chapter 13 tells us that that book is the Lamb's book of life. That's what we need to have our name written in, the Lamb's book of life. And if we have our name written in the Lamb's book of life, we're going to be delivered in this time of trouble. And we want to be delivered in this time of trouble. So how do we get our names written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, it's not wrong to join a church. That's absolutely uh, a positive thing we want to do. But what we really need in addition to that is to be connected with Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 3 gives us the answer to this question. How are we going to find our names written in the book? How are we going to be able to be delivered in this time of trouble when probation is closed and the seven last plagues are poured out? Malachi chapter 3. Notice what it says here beginning with verse 15 of Malachi chapter 3. And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness, they are, uh, they that, or they are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Now pause there for just a second and think about that verse. I have never Imagine that this verse would have its application to our world, at least our country, as it does today. Those that are proud are, are, are set up. Those that work with, now we call the proud happy. You know, we have a whole month now for pride month, right? Those that are proud, are, we call happy. Those that work wickedness are set up. Those that tempt God are delivered. I mean, you can go into stores now and you can steal and rob, which is a violation of, of God's law, and you're set free. Yeah, you're set free. You can, you're, you're free to do that. There's, there's never been a time when this verse has been so applicable. But notice verse 36. In this time when this is happening, verse uh, 16, excuse me, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord heard it and hearkened, and a book of remembrance was written before him for they that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. And ye shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. We're almost out of time, but we'll pick up with these verses. We won't, we won't leave these. We're going to spend a little more time on these as we, as we build a little bit on these last verses in Daniel chapter 11. But the main point we're seeing here is that our only safety is to connect with Jesus, to abide in Jesus, to be thinking about his name, to be focusing on Jesus. Revelation 14 puts it this way in verse 4, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That's what God is calling us to, to get our names written in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, are you ready to follow the Lamb wherever He goes? Not to follow politics wherever it goes, not to follow all of the things that are happening in this world wherever they take you, to follow the Lamb, to follow Jesus Christ wherever He goes because that is your safety. And by beholding Him, you will become changed. I pray that you'll make that decision to follow Jesus wherever He goes.